So hi, um, my name is Ido. I co-maintain the MLXSW driver together with uh, Jerry Pirko, working at NVIDIA previously in Menelox. So this presentation is divided into two um, planned features and recently added features that are already upstream. So I want to start with the planned features because I think it's a better use of our time. Um, right. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, device metrics. Uh, this is the outcome of a two-day hackathon we recently had in the company on uh, Monday and Tuesday, something uh, I worked on together with Amit and Daniel from our team. So the problem we are trying to solve is that uh, we want to improve the debuggability and visibility of our hardware under Linux. Now, the issue is, is that most of the metrics today in the networking subsystem are NetDev centric, which means that they are per port and not per device. Uh, and they are usually exposed via either RT Netlink or ETH tool. In addition, they are usually not configurable, which means that you can't enable or disable these metrics. Uh, which can become an issue if enabling these metrics adds latency or consume hardware resources, such as counters. Um, and also, we, at least in the Spectrum ASICs, we have histogram agents that allows us to uh, sample various parameters, such as a TXQ, like over 1 million times per second. And then we can get uh, a histogram of the length of the TX queue. Uh, and this is something that you can probably achieve in the software data path using PPF, because each time you send a packet, you get an event, and you can calculate the histograms. But we don't have this ability with hardware offload, because the CPU does not see the packets. Um, and another thing is that the metrics uh, are usually hardware specific and they are not mapped into any relevant software objects. So for example, uh, in the Spectrum ASIC, we have a single hardware VTAC, which is able doing encapsulation and decapsulation of VXM packets. And it, is, and it has metrics of its own. And, but this VTAC is, is logically mapped by the driver into various VXLAN net devices. So exposing the metrics of this single hardware VTAP via multiple uh, VXLAN net devices would be uh, both inaccurate and confusing. Another example is something we have in Spectrum 2, which is an algorithmic TCAM. So you know we have this nice user interface to push uh, filters to the kernel, TC filters, and remove them. Uh, but underneath, it's completely it's very complicated. Uh, so in Spectrum 1, we have, we have an actual circuit TCA to which we push these uh, ACL rules. But in Spectrum 2, in order to improve the scale and reduce the power consumption, we have an algorithmic TCA. And it's very, it's relatively complex. And currently, we have like zero visibility into uh, if what we are doing is correct or incorrect, or efficient or inefficient. So we have these metrics that we need to be able to expose the user space in order to debug our code. And the third example is histograms, which I already explained. So if you are a kernel developer, you would usually say, OK, so just expose it using debugfs, right? But if you are a networking person, you know that this is unacceptable. Uh, and I think rightfully so. Uh, first of all, if we do it using debugfs, it's driver specific, which means any other drivers needs to, for example, uh, expose some hardware histogram agents is going to duplicate the same interface. Uh, and it's also not a stable interface. It can come and go. And you can see David Miller saying that he wants to remove some debugfs entry himself. Um, so this is a, a quote from uh, David Miller. Uh, our leader, uh, that he instead would like to see uh, a web-typed and generic interface to expose 
uh, this stuff to user space. And I, I think that our proposed solution answer this. So the overall overview is that we extended the kernel to allow device drivers to create and destroy, I mean, to register the met their metrics with DevLink, which, as you know, is a subsystem within the Linux kernel to manage devices as opposed to individual ports. Uh, and then DevLink is exposing uh, these metrics over NetLink to user space. So we extended uh, IPROP2, the, specifically the DevLink executable, to query and configure these metrics from the kernel. And we also wrote a, a Prometheus exporter that, exposed, that exports these metrics over HTTP to Prometheus. So to give more details, um, at the top is the proposed interface, what we currently have implemented. And probably next week, I will clean up the code and I will send an RFC uh, in case you have comments. So currently, the, the only type of metrics is a counter. Uh, but uh, in the future, we would like to add also histograms. So you can uh, query the metrics, and you can also group them together. And the reason that we added this grouping is that so later on, you could uh, ask the kernel for a filtered dump. Like, let's say you have a lot of counters, so you don't want to send multiple networking requests. Give me this counter, give me this, this metric, this metric, this metric, and then get multiple responses. You want to send one uh, request and get a single uh, netlink message with all the relevant metrics. So in bold at the bottom, yeah, at the bottom, so we have, in bold we have the future extensions that we would like to eventually do. So first of all, to enable or disable a certain metric in order to reduce latency or not consume hardware resources uh, when possible, and also to be able to configure um, hardware uh, histogram agents, whether they are linear or, or exponential, what is the mean value, max value, number of uh, buckets in case it's configurable, and obviously the sampling interval. Um, so this is a screenshot. Um, showing the interface, the proposed interface. Again, this is not upstream. Uh, so you can query the metrics. Uh, then you can query a specific metric or group them together and ask for uh, a filter dump from the kernel for only these uh, specific metrics. And yeah, I have a typo there. I see it should be kernel, not kernel. Um, so in order not to make this a huge mess, like ETH tool, where you have a lot of <laughs> different uh, counters and you have no idea what they are doing, what they are counting. So from, from the get-go, we would like to make sure that every single metric we add to the kernel is um, documented in the kernel, uh, specifically under the DevLink documentation. So this is an example of what we already have. Uh, questions? This was the first topic. So you plan to standardize on the names, right, Ido? Um, this is what you're saying. Sorry? You plan to standardize on these names, and it will be a standard uh, name. It's not, it's not unlike ETH tool, it's not uh, driver defined, you're saying. So uh, actually it is, but I want it to be documented. So each device driver will, have, will document the metrics that it is exposing. Okay. I'm not sure we can make this stuff generic. Yeah, I mean, okay. Sorry? Yeah, understood. Yeah, because at, at least in, in Spectrum, you know, we have like stuff that is specific to Spectrum, how the hardware is designed. Uh, and like we have metrics that the hardware designers thought it would be good to have. So perhaps we can do it in the same way we, uh, we, we do that for params, where we have like uh, generic params which work for all the drivers, and then we have mm -hmm. something which is uh, driver-specific. So I think it should work like that as well. 
-hmm. Yeah, so I think maybe at least in this example, the, the VIXs and the NCAP and DCAP counters, very, maybe even the arrows and discards, like nothing, uh, nothing special. So the v uh, for this specific example, for the VXLAN NCAP and DCAP, uh, how is it different from, say, stats on a VXLAN device if it's... So it's not different, but in hardware, like, like I mentioned in the beginning, maybe I'll show, show again. So we have a single VTAP in, in Spectrum, but yeah. the driver logically maps it into various VXLAN devices. So if global. like we, sorry? Sorry, it's only global. Yeah, it's global. And if I expose it for each net device, it would be inaccurate. Yeah. I, so I am single? aware of your, uh, of your uh, model where we have a, a single VX net device yeah. in which we multiplex multiple VNIs. And in this case, we could uh, actually exposing, expose it using the net device. Got it. So when you showed the example here with groups, your group seemed to be a number, whereas text, something like VTAN or algorithmic uh, T, uh, TCAM would be much more user friendly. So the, maybe I wasn't clear, the grouping is by default, when the device driver is registering its metrics with DevLink, then they are all in the default group of uh, zero. And the purpose of grouping is so that you as a user could define which metrics you want to group in order to query them more or less atomically. And now I understand that you also suggest having like another level of grouping so that user will know which metrics are logically connected. Um, so we can either do it in the user API or maybe just document it. Uh, not sure. I mean, I can add just, another column here. I'm just thinking of the typical use case you're generally interested in just one block of hardware in the device, not all blocks of hardware in the device. Mm -hmm. So being able to easily just get the VTAM, VCAM, uh, the TCAM, or just get the VLAN stuff would be probably nice. Yeah, I understand. Okay, also, so if, you're wrap yeah, I don't think so. if you're wrapping some sort of SNMP MIB around this, this is also probably going to be different MIBs. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think uh, maybe we can extend it so that the device driver will also say which metrics are logically uh, related and then uh, we can expose it like this to user space. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Before you move on, um, Ido Jamal says there is a raised hand and I'm not sure how to see the raised hand. Um, I had mine raised. Does my, does my mic work? Yes. Oh, okay. I was just wondering, I, I don't know if this is a crazy idea, but does it make sense to expose these metrics under the sys file system? Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm going to say. I'm, I'm more of a BSD guy, so I'm, you know, I'm more a recent Linux person, so maybe that's a crazy yeah. <laughs> suggestion. Yeah, so, so it's not going to fly in the networking subsystem. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Christian, there's a yeah, recent, yeah. Uh, yeah, recent thread on NetDev about somebody asking the same thing. It, maybe it's just not an efficient way to do it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But well, we are actually trying to shift from the CFS as much as possible in, for cases like this, uh, so. Yeah, I mean, when you're using a user application like VPP, right, it's a shared memory, which is super efficient, but I don't think that it can be done here. Yeah. Okay, so I see that I'm already at the okay. four months. So I want to move to the next topic. Um, so first of all, here, unlike the previous one, uh, we are still at the hand waving phase. Uh, I don't have anything concrete, um, just to be perfectly clear. Um, okay, so resilient hashing. Uh, so as you all know, we have uh, 
ECMP support in the kernel uh, in, case, in case we want to route a packet via different routers. Um, but we don't have support for resilient hashing or resilient ECMP. So what we have in the kernel actually is, I mean, the multipath algorithm is called hash threshold. And it's working like this for both IPv4 and IPv6. So if you look in this uh, picture that I took from an RFC, you can see that we have uh, five uh, next stops. And these are logical next stops. And in case of ECMP equal cost, then they are uh, equally distributed in the key space, which in our case is in the kernel is 32 bit. So we have uh, the first bucket, the second bucket, and up until the fifth bucket. Now, let's say uh, that next stop three goes down, okay? So ideally, we wouldn't want any flows that are currently hashed to the first bucket or any other bucket that is not free to be affected by this. Um, because in certain cases, when you don't route the packet to the same uh, destination via different path, but you're using ECMP to actually distribute the traffic between different servers, then uh, you want the, a specific flow to still go to the same server whenever the, even whenever the next of group uh, changes. So you can see that uh, like flows that are currently uh, hashed to the second bucket uh, in, I mean, near the border with the first bucket will actually transition to the first bucket after next of three goes down, which means that uh, the current algorithm we have in the kernel is not resilient. Um, another algorithm, which is relatively simple, is called uh, modulo n, where you just take the hash result of the flow and do modulo n, where n is the number of next stops. So obviously, if an extra uh, is added or removed, then all the flows are affected, and this is a relatively disruptive algorithm. And we would like to add resilient hashing support. The question is if to do it in the kernel or in user space. One second. So in order to explain the problem better, I took uh, figures from the uh, actually Kumulus documentation, which is very good, now in NVIDIA. Uh, so, I mean, resilient hashing is nothing uh, special. It's like regular ECMP, but it's simply a clever way of populating the, the hash buckets uh, with the logical next stops. So, um, in this example, we have like 12 hash buckets instead of n, where n is the number of next stops. So, we have like four logical next stops, and they are distributed using Raudrombit between uh, 12 hash buckets. And so you can see that, for example, in the second uh, figure, if next stop B goes down, uh, it allows us to immediately, so first of all, the, the size of the group does not change, and other next stops uh, populate its place, take its place. So if we only had like four buckets, then one next stop would get twice the traffic as other next stop. So it wouldn't be equal cost anyway. Uh, but this way, the traffic is still equally distributed between all the logical next stops, between the three remaining logical next stops. And obviously, uh, all the traffic that went to uh, next stop other than B is unaffected by the fact that next stop B was removed. The second flow, which is more problematic, is when you want to add a next stop to a group. Let's say we have four next stops and we want to add next stop E, fifth next stop. So the correct way to do it would be to check the activity of each hash bucket so that you make sure that when you replace an existing next stop with the, with the new next stop, then you are not impacting existing traffic. You are not doing the replacement on an active bucket. Uh, when possible. So, in this case, you can see that the uh, purple flow and the blue flow were not affected 
uh, they still go to next stop A and next stop D, respectively. But the red flow did change from next stop B to next stop C. Um, okay, so as you know or don't know, like in the last year, uh, David M um, added the the great next stop API, which basically breaks the uh, the routes the routes from the next stop, so you can uh, program the two differently. You can program the next stop, and then you can add a route and say this points to next stop ID X. Uh, now we have two proposals for resilient hashing. First one in user space and the second one in kernel space. Uh, so the user space proposal was very appealing to me at first because personally I, I would like to keep the kernel as boring as possible. And if we can do something using BPF or in user space, then I would prefer to do it this way. But Thinking about it more, I, I'm not sure uh, this is actually achievable. And I will explain why. I mean, it gets really complicated really fast. Um, so the key point here is that the next stop IDs are no longer logical next stops, but they are the hash buckets, which means that we lose the ability to share a next stop between multiple groups. So it immediately increases the memory overhead, which I believe was one of David's main goals for this API. Um, and user space will be able to control the number of buckets in each group and the mapping of the logical next stops, meaning the gateway and the device to the bucket. Uh, and also, obviously, how to uh, do the replacement. Now, the two flows that we previously mentioned, the next stop removal and addition. Uh, so the, the removal is partially addressed by the RFC that David sent back in June with the active backup groups. And I will explain why partially in a minute. But basically, this uh, API, which I think, which I still think is a great addition, uh, allows you to define a new group with only two next stops, where one is primary and the second is active. Um, and so yeah. it is, are you, when you say user space, are you talking about a control plane like FRR? Yes, yes, driving the, yes. Okay. Yeah, good, good point. Um, so yes, it's important to emphasize that uh, for, at least for the user space solution, you do need some very clever daemon running in user space uh, in order to get resilient hashing which is not needed with the kernel solution. Um, OK, and for next stop addition, like I previously explained, explained we need uh, activity information from the kernel in order to know which next stop ID, meaning which hash bucket we can populate with the new next stop. And this is currently something we do not have. We don't have activity information uh, from the kernel regarding next stops. So even if we go with this solution, it doesn't mean that uh, kernel uh, can support it without uh, modifications. So the initial state, let's take the previous example. We, are, we, we only had 12 hash buckets. Uh, is represented here using uh, next stops 101 to 112. And the ECMP group itself has the ID of 10,001. And all the uh, buckets are members in this group. Now, the buckets themselves are active backup and next stop groups. Why? So that whenever a next stop is removed, the size of the ECMP group does not change. So let's say that next stop B was removed. Like in, in this example, you can see that the size of the ECMP group is still, is still 12 buckets. Now, the reason I said that this is partially addressed by the active backup API is that this does handle correctly the case where only one next stop is removed. But if more than one next stop is removed, then we will start to, the kernel will start to delete uh, the hash buckets that have 
zero active uh, next, stop, next stops. And then the, the size of the ECMP group will change. So I don't have uh, a good solution for this, if the user space suggestion. Um, addition of a next stop uh, can be done by replacing the individual uh, buckets. So like I, I previously mentioned, we do need some activity indication from the kernel in order to know which buckets, which next stop IDs we can remove and which we cannot. So I have two proposals for this, um, but, but this is the details if we decide to go with the user space approach. So I want to skip this part and go to the kernel suggestion. I mean, we, we can discuss this later either uh, in a meeting or over the mailing list, no, no problem. So uh, the, the user space suggestion, it gets really complicated really fast and uh, it's, I, see, I think it's basically an abuse of the next of API um, because instead of managing, managing logical next stops, you, you say, no, now it's actually hash buckets and you cannot share a next stop ID between multiple groups which I think is, is quite weird. So the kernel suggestion also relies on the new Nextop API, which hopefully everyone will migrate to one day. Uh, and it is about adding a new group type that says this Nextop group is not a regular multipath Nextop group. It's for resilient hashing. Um, and then we, 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 we keep the abstraction where the next stop ID is a logical next stop, not logical next stop, and we add uh, parameters that are relevant for this uh, new multipath uh, group, such as the number of buckets and some timers that I will explain soon. And then uh, the kernel is the one who is managing the, the individual buckets. Let's say you can have a next stop group with four next stops, but you say that the number of buckets is, I don't know, 256 or F a K. And then the kernel is doing the mapping between the logical next stops and the number of buckets. Um, so first of all, we need to implement this uh, resilient algorithm inside the kernel, and then we can also use it for hardware offload in case you are doing the, in case your hardware is doing the switching, the routing instead of the kernel. But at least it, gave, it gives us like feature parity. It's not like this feature is specific to hardware. You get both resilient hashing in software and in hardware. And we, we do need some extensions for the kernel. We need new attributes, uh, like the number of buckets. We need uh, timers so that, uh, yeah, someone has a question. Okay. Um, Quick time check, Ido. You yeah, I see. Slides. Yeah. Keep going. Okay, so I, I will not reach the recently added features, but uh, basically I did want to float around this uh, kernel solution to see if anyone has an opinion. Uh, I guess mainly David. No, that seems fine to me so far. Um, I do think it's going to be really tricky with the uh, activity monitor. It, you mean the user space approach? Just in general, keeping track of if it's being used or not. Um, I mean, that seems to be the trickiest part to the whole resilient hashing problem. Why does the user space care about whether the particular hash is being used or not? So you, you're talking about the kernel solution? No. Or the user space solution. I could have sworn you were, I, maybe I misheard you then. I could have sworn you said that the user space would need to track that as well. Yeah, if, if you need, if we are going with the user space proposal, but if we are going with the kernel proposal, then, then you as FRR, you don't need to do anything special. Just say uh, this multipath group is, is for resilient hashing. This is the number of buckets and mm -hmm. that's it. And you get the rest of the service from the kernel. But I do want to extend the, the Nextop API 
so that uh, it can expose the, the mapping between the logical ID and the bucket so that we can debug this. But it's like read only. Yeah, so just to, uh, to update you, like I think next week I'm going to start working more seriously about the next stop stuff. And I, I will keep this stuff in mind so that we design, the, we design it correctly. Uh, I mean, the interface towards the device drivers. And I, I will probably ping you over the mailing list again with a more concrete proposal. Cool. So you're first adding the uh, next job group support and then moving on to yes. the hashing? Yes. Yes. Cool. Yeah, given that FRR also has support now upstream, hopefully, David, it'll all be yeah, it was, next year. It was added uh, too soon. The, the support to FRR. <laughs> <laughs> I know David is here to check whether it's being used or not. It's being used. It's in. Yep. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, you are next. So this is a update on Project Dent. I'm not sure if people are aware or heard of it, um, but I will talk, I'll give some introduction. So if you're plugged into the world of network operating systems, uh, you will definitely know how many kinds there are and uh, how many are still popping up. So, and many of them are part of Linux Foundation. But they, unlike, a, unlike the server world where everything is standardized and the offload model is mostly standardized, um, it's a mix of plays in the open network operating systems world. And when I use the word open network operating systems, it means a open net distribution, Linux distribution that goes on a network switch or a router. Okay. So Cumulus Linux uh, is just first in the list there because it was started way uh, early because when the open networking revolution started. What we're talking about here is when the boxes became open, uh, disaggregated, uh, Cisco's and Arista's and other vendors had their own closed operating systems and then they became open and Cumulus was one of them. So what Cumulus does is it's a Debian based distribution. It standardizes on the Linux API, but it has an abstraction to convert between Linux API to the vendor SDK uh, API, user space SDKs. And most of the ASICs in the space have a user space driver and an SDK for application development on writing directly to that ASIC. That's how it's been for years or decades. Okay, Sonic is another one. You must have heard about Sonic. There's, I think there's also a talk on Monday. It standardizes the user space SDK API. And this was a project that Microsoft started because they wanted a API to access the hardware, the switch ASIC easier, query metrics and so on. So that standardizes the SDK API. It's a user space SDK API. I have pointers to links to anybody who wants to know about these. Danos is another one which was started by at and uh, It is under Linux Foundation, but it's used in mostly the tel telecom space. Again, it's, it's a mix of offload uh, similar to Sonic. They're leveraging uh, the SI API and so on. Mellanox Linux Switch. Uh, this is a product from Mellanox, which is based on switch dev driver. It allows you to pick a Linux distribution and use their switch dev driver. It is not a complete NOS offering by itself, but it is there for open uh, operating systems on a switch. ONL, uh, Open Networking Linux. This is another one which provides the base for platform abstraction of an open NOS. And it's not a NOS, complete NOS by itself. It's just a platform abstraction. And many other NOSs are based on ONL. So you'll see ONL a lot more uh, in context of other NOSes. So Dent Distributed Enterprise is the NOS that Amazon uh, is starting with the seed code, um, Amazon Go to be um, uh, specific there, the retail space. And it is a Linux Foundation project. There's a link there on the Linux Foundation press release. It is targeted towards the network edge and retail and campus deployments. These are slightly lower end hardwares, um, like one gig boxes, cost-effective solution for these retail markets, okay? 
Now, note that DENT does not itself, the OS itself does not put restrictions on what uh, the software can do or the OS can do or what packages it can go in. It can be for data center tomorrow, but it's starting with uh, the seed code for, um, for this space. So founding members, the list is there and the seed code is coming from Amazon. Standardizes on the Linux API and uses switch dev for offload or to switch ASIC. So it very much is in context of this, uh, this space that we're talking about. Um, so this architecture with switch dev is used multiple times. I'm not gonna go detail into it, but basically the control plane is a Linux server control plane, you can say, with a routing stack and everything talks Linux API, Netlink API to the kernel, and the kernel talks to the driver and the driver uploads it to the ASIC. Okay, so the hardware, uh, there is a long list of hardware. Uh, Moni is also on the call can uh, probably list it down, but uh, in the interest of time, this, I'm not gonna go detailed into this, but one is from WNC with a Marvel ASIC, and the other one is a Delta box with a Mellanox uh, Spectrum ASIC. When I say Mellanox Spectrum, it means the Mellanox switch up driver that uh, Edo and Eri work on. So what are the components of this OS? Um, it starts from ONL. Um, ONL, the base system, which is a Debian based, and ONL is under OCP. If people are not aware of OCP, it's the Open Compute um, Foundation started by Facebook. And it is a, um, but it, it has a huge community for hardware vendors, for open hardware vendors, both servers, NICs, and uh, switches. ONL is part of that. It was initially, it initially came from Big Switch, which got bought over by Arista, and, some of Arista is maintaining this. So the reason for picking up uh, DENT was, uh, ONL for DENT was mainly because it's an already available base um, and people can start using it. The other thing that comes here is ONLP. ONLP is not a Linux API based, but the community of ONL or open hardware has grown so much that most of these vendors do have an ONL driver and ONL P compatible API. Okay, then the next component is of course switch dev drivers. The platform drivers can be Linux platform drivers, and I'll, uh, I have an example to one uh, by Mellanox, and ONLP drivers will work too. But the goal of the project is to actually move towards Linux platform drivers where available. Software and control plane. Uh, usual Debian ecosystem, FRR for the control plane, many packages from Debian, including uh, IFF done two for interface configuration. Additional cap capabilities in this particular space is power over ethernet. And surprisingly, again, power over ethernet uh, is controlled by a bunch of user space commands or you know SDKs. So this is something um, that is not an open, um, standard API for it. So Linux uh, platform drivers, I do want to touch upon this a little bit. Uh, when During the inception of Dent, I am on the Dent TSC, and it's hard to say when you, when you tell people, oh, Linux has platform drivers, API, and you know, it's just a SysFS, you can use it, right? So, and the only documentation, structured documentation around it, I found was, or the Dent team found was on a Mellanox implementation. I have a link there. But you can develop platform, Linux platform drivers for this using the Linux API and so on. So the example has been, uh, we have been trying to talk to people, hardware vendors to move to this API. But if you think about the future in the space, I think, ACPI would be better if the hardware supports it. Uh, one such effort was started long ago by um, Cumulus under the OCP project. It was called APD. But uh, I think that would be an easier way, given servers use it as well, to standardize some of these platform drivers. Um, the switch ASIC offload drivers, again, called switch dev drivers. Mellanox has had one, MLXSW, the Edo just talked about. It's been there in the tree for several versions of the kernel. And the new switch of driver that is being submitted is by Marvel. 
and it is in its fourth version and going through reviews. Okay, where to find Dent? The code is not public yet because the seed code needs to be a bit tested and integrated and then uh, published. There is a mailing list. Um, seed code will be out sometime soon. There is a talk at ONIS and this year we expect more um, workshops for this. And given its use in ONL, I'm pretty sure it's going to be talked about in the OCP communities as well. Okay. So I have a question actually regarding the code. I'm, I'm having troubles to understand what exactly is the nature of this code. Uh, I mean, uh, I understand that the, the, the distribution is based on Debian and there's apparently something on top of that. What is that exactly? So, so ONL is a Debian der derivative, right? Like uh, it has its build system and it comes with its own layer of ONLP, which is an API library for platform. And, um, and on top of that is just the kernel. It, ONL allows you to pick any kernel that you want. So for example, right now it's on uh, 5.6 is being talked about to be picked up for Dent. Uh, other than that, it's a combination of packages. It's, it's basically a distribution, picking versions that it is needed and tested. And the whole goal of the project is to put this distribution out there and put a hardware compatibility list. Does that answer your question? I don't think so. I, I still, I'm still missing the, the what is the code about. I mean, what you described is uh, basically any distribution, the set of packages and the versions and stuff like that. But uh, there is some code uh, uh, which is not uh, published yet, but I have really no clue what this is about. Yeah, the code is just basically the Debian, um, the ONL distribution, the build system. It's just like Sonic, right? Sonic is a, if you go to sonic.com, you will find a way to build the entire distribution and you will know that the project, the listed HCL or hardware compatibility list that the project uh, is talking about, when you build that distribution with the inst instructions, it will work on that hardware and it will come with that hardware uh, drivers. So when, it's, when you're talking about code of a distribution, it is basically building that combination of packages and building that image of the operating system that can be installed via ONI, for example. It's a start point. Yeah. Start point for writing your own NAS. So it takes care of some of the common packaging and common um, platform driver needs for certain hardware. Okay, I understand. Can so, you hear me? So. Yeah. I think that there are like two important things here. One is the basic fact that building an ONI binary is something that people find challenging. And this is done by ONI, um, like uh, by nature. And the second thing is like this uh, huge um, heavy lifting that people need to do when they just want to introduce their new protocol or their new networking stack or whatever. And they have this option for you know, to start from something. So it's, it's just there and it's, it's not trivial, but it's useful. Yeah. So if you compare it with Sonic, Sonic is also like that. Today, the um, Sonic project actually has a list of drivers that it supports or has a list of vendors that have contributed drivers. So when you're building Sonic, you know that whatever comes out of it as a starting point, you will have uh, these particular drivers or it will work and the image that uh, you can build an image, only compatible image like Moni was talking about. Okay. And ONL, by the way, ONL is uh, used. Uh, Rupa, there's a bunch of questions. People have raised their hands, including me, but uh, you want to look at those? How do I see that? I see Jamal, Moni, and Rubens are raising the hands. So. 
Good, Jamal. And I don't see any raised hands. Are there any messages? This is three in total. I think that Monet just spoke, so we can cross him out. And uh, Rubens is the next, I guess. Uh, Was that oops. Rubens, are you there? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, can you can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so regarding this, um, one challenge we we found is to actually get uh, platform code from from the vendors, so from from the various vendors. Is there any work as well ongoing with this tent project to find an easier solution to actually get platform code and platform um, um, information from the vendors? Yeah, so what I have found is uh, it's been hard to get them to adopt the Linux model uh, to build the drivers. But if you look at ONL and ONLP, most of these hardware vendors do have uh, drivers. And um, even the hardware specs, I think OCP is the best place to get all the hardware specs for most of this hardware because the hardware yeah. is mostly common. Most of these vendors, they submit to OCP, they submit to the Dash project, the Sonic project, and so on. Okay, but Does so that there... help? And yeah, I guess so. Yeah, but but there's no there's no one effort just to centralize it as much as possible. Yeah, no, I, I would say no. Oh, okay. That's why I'm, I comment there and you know, so like. Um, like how it's done in the server world would probably be the best long-term solution. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so most of these type of distros, I don't know, I've heard of this ONLP thing, but <laughs> do they, uh, how do they have dependencies, their patches in the kernel and their own drivers with their own patches, nothing is upstream uh, friendly, right? Or is this different? Yes. Yeah, many of them are out of out of tree. I think only uh, Mellanox has in tree drivers. Yeah. And they probably have some patches uh, that will never ever make it upstream. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. th this is very unappealing, if that's a right, the, a good English word. It's not very appealing to have all these. Uh, so you want to upgrade, you start putting a lot of patches, basically. Right, you want to use your own kernel, uh, right? Yeah. That's Not true, Jamal, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I think that like there are projects which prove that this can work long-term and eventually they can, uh, it can evolve. Like if you look at OpenWRT, for example, they, they basically have had the same thing and they are, they are pushing things back and uh, basically changing things upstream as well. So it can work, it can work in a certain, uh, space. Yeah, and I think platforms is something that we should talk about in the Linux communities as well. So uh, I, I think the difference with OpenWRT, uh, if I may, uh, is it's mostly for consumer devices where, you know, I just want to run it to my router. I'm not interested in adding some extra feature. Whereas I think this will, this code probably works on a few boxes. You mentioned a Mellanox uh, switch and a Marvel, I think, right? So right now. it may not... Okay, I, I, I'm very skeptical about this. I've, I've suffered through crap that comes from Broadcom. I'm sorry if there's any Broadcom people on there. Uh, uh, where they have all kinds. I just want to build a kernel and it's hell. Uh, you know, because they have all these patches, their own version of GCC, their own versions of the linker. You can't use anything other than what they provide you. And if it doesn't work, you can't find the right person to answer the question. So, but I think if you think, see the open networking world, I mean, it's going to be a slow progress and it's come a long way. I mean, right now, the trend that I see between NOSs, Sonic and um, others, I mean, people are using uh, technologies. The recent one, I, uh, S-Flow, S-Flow sample that was added to P-sampling that was added for Linux is now being used on most, even on Sonic. So. We do see cross-pollination these days and hopefully things will rub in the right direction and hopefully we'll be talking about it in uh, good terms next. 
following years. Yeah, I think documentation is key. I'm uh, on platform drivers, especially like uh, the debug FS comment that Edo made. So there's a lot of SysFS file stuff that many vendors do as well, which is not standardized, right? The usual SysFS thermal monitoring and uh, many other things. So yeah, I think we'll have a deeper discussion probably in the next workshop. So I've got a question in that area. In your previous attempt with ACPI, did you get the Linux ACPI maintainers involved or the UEFA? Or was it just your own personal work? No, I think Russell, Russell King was the, uh, or I'm getting the name wrong. Wasn't he the, yeah. I'll send you pointers, uh, Andrew. I think you are the best person to uh, tell us if that can be taken further. Actually, I'm the wrong person because I clearly say I know nothing about ACPI and I defer to the ACPI maintainers and they don't want to get involved. <laughs> Which is, I'll come on to that a little bit in my part of the presentation. Okay, sounds good. So I think I will end this and I'll try to cover my next networking updates in, in say five minutes. Let me share. But uh, on a ending on a positive note, uh, Jamal, for you too, I think uh, there is interest in moving to the platform drivers and upstreaming drivers. I think it's going to take some time. I think Marvel is also working on it. Okay, I, I'm actually pleasantly surprised I had Marvel had a switch dev driver. That was good. There's yeah. progress being made. Yeah. yeah. All their layer two switches are switch dev drivers via DSA. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I see all those nice patches, but I, I wonder if uh, there's a commodity hardware I can buy and, try and test it out. DSA tends to be more used in industrial settings and not black box layer two switches. Okay, so yeah, interest of time, I'm just gonna start and try to run through this, um, this work. So basically this is uh, similar to the lines of what EO covered. It's basically the um, patches that are going in upstream to support networking, more networking features on uh, Switch ASIC. So one key thing or one important thing that has happened in recent times is the FRR multi-homing. It's still, I think the code is mostly upstream, but FRR will become the open implementation of any multi-homing protocol. And uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's basically connected to two switches. There is a software running, a protocol running between the switches to actually keep that sessions alive, right? There is failover, there is uh, filtering, there is duplicate packet handling, and uh, basically a backup. Each switch acts as a backup to the other. And this is a traditional multi-homing solution. And um, what I'm gonna talk about is an open implementation or open standard protocol. But uh, prior to this, uh, there has been no such protocol. Everybody, every vendor has had their own proprietary implementation. Um, yeah. So what is the open um, multi-homing solution? It's on the XLAN overlay, it's called eVPN. If you, you'll probably hear a lot about this on the FRR mailing lists. Um, the idea is it's a BGP based eVPN multi-homing control plane. Um, you connect your server to multiple switches. There is no limitation of two right now. I mean, there is, it can move to any number, redundant switches. And the switches, instead of having a dedicated link between them, they use the BXN overlay to you know, do whatever is required to keep that um, uh, redundancy alive. So the one thing that um, uh, a feature that went into recently is the use of FDB ECMP next job groups. So I'll mention David here again, since he's here. Um, so David, uh, like Ido mentioned, he added the 
uh, route next up route support. And I was perfect for this. It, I'm glad that his patches went in earlier. Uh, otherwise, it would have been a um, yeah a bit huge project. So what this means is VXLAN, since now VXLAN can talk to, okay, let me take a step back. Now you're talking to multiple multi-homing peers, switch peers over VXLAN, and you can have two or more redundant uh, pairs. And you want to basically ECMP some of the uh, forwarding to them, right? Because the hosts are connected from all the three, all the participating switches. And the example here basically shows a VXLAN FDB entry, which points to a next stop group, and the next stop group um, is uh, created by the next stop group uh, API that David uh, added. Thanks for the review and support there, David. Um, so another set of challenges uh, supporting such a multi-homing protocol is basically um, on the switches, since we use the Linux networking stack, uh, along with the control plane protocol. And the control plane is understands the distributed uh, neighbor and IP relationships of hosts from all other switches. But at the same time, it is relying on the Linux kernel bridge and the Linux kernel neighbor database to um, understand or to um, learn local entries, locally connected entries, okay? It understands stuff from the VXLAN because it via the protocol. But what we found is, and uh, FRR team has come uh, has had approached us with a bunch of requests on how to <clears throat> make this easier on the control plane. Basically, kernel is racing to kernel just received a packet because the host moved. And okay, one step back again. This is mostly these race conditions involve. Uh, Mac moves when a host moves from being a local locally collect, connected host to you know it moves over the VXLAN to another rack. So what we are talking about here is kernel just learning a neighbor locally when BGP is not still understood and BGP is trying to update the kernel and there, there could be a race between the Netlink API and the kernel itself learning that object through a packet. And some of the API extensions here were done to ease that uh, possibility of races. One is the bridge notify, which Nikolai, um, Nikolai added. This is to indicate to the control plane that, hey, this Mac is particularly, is, has become locally active. It's, it generates a Netlink notification, a synchronous notification to indicate that, oh, uh, this neighbor, which was static or which was considered previously not locally active is now locally active. And then the local timers kick in. Similarly, in the neighbor entry, there is a patch pending. They've not upstreamed it yet, but there is a new flag to indicate that a particular neighbor is seen by my peer switch. But I also want to know if you're seeing it again to converge faster in a case of a Mac uh, or of a host move. So in general miscellaneous updates, um, there is a proto down reason that went in. It's a small patch, it's, uh, but there was a huge request for it from most of the network operating people or operators uh, on why doesn't Linux support a way to uh, indicate a link was brought down by a protocol and existence of multiple users of that uh, proto down flag. So, Proto down is basically a net device flag. It just puts the interface down on request of a control plane. It brings the carrier down because the administrator does not know about it because the protocol has to put it down. And the reasons for this, the main reason is in a multi-homing protocol where you know you have to put a link down and the control plane knows better because you don't want packets looping or duplicate packets to the hosts. And VRRP uses it today also to indicate a uh, backup uh, backup switch and so on. So the idea is here, and this goes hand in hand with the uh, ETH tool uh, extended link state that was added recently by uh, Mellanox. And I think Ido was going to talk about it, but uh, he ran out of time as well. But this, uh, these are the reasons for why a link is down. And that could be, yeah. Um, 
uh, this actually the link ETH tool extended state could also have a proto down. Okay, this reason it's because of the proto down that needs to be added. So in other um, other switch offload stuff, uh, this is not supported by a switch dev drive, but uh, just an update that uh, by using IP tables and con and it was interesting. So, uh, basically you and this is uh, the main um, thing is about dynamic NAT where you need to collaborate with the kernel and the hardware to actually get the NAT rules and hardware the dynamically learned NAT rules and this was uh, uh, IP tables dynamic entry trap the first packet to CPU matching the NAT, NAT, NAT entry and then contract does its usual job and the switch ASIC driver will listen to the netlink notification and program the dynamically created route by contract into the hardware. And from then, the NAT happens in hardware. So this was another uh, example of how easily the kernel data plane and the hardware can work together on something like this. Okay. So I, I raised my hand. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. If you on, on that slide. Uh, so yes, yes. Uh, why, why do you need a contract in this case? I, I'm assuming that what, whatever NAT is in hardware is probably very stateless, right? You yes. don't need contracting. You just need to probably either translate uh, IP address to IP address. Yeah. Unless you are saying you can also do ports. Uh, you only do IP address to IP address. Yes. So this is dynamic NAT where you give a range of IP addresses and ports and you mm -hmm want to kernel will allocate a pretty pick a particular um, address from that range to snat and dnat and create the contract entry and that entry is what you want to really uh, add it into the uh, no i mean i mean it, it, this is a bit heavy is what I'm, I'm saying right you you basically yeah. are listening to contracting and you're running contracting on the switch just so you can add NAT, unless you have other users for contracting Yes. On the switch. Yeah. Could you not have used? Um, PC. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> I know right. that uh, I have the PC in there. Yes, yes, it has NAT, but it's only state stateless NAT, which is what you need, I think, which maps much better to hardware. You, because all you have to do is uh, basically inject uh, uh, netlink, right, into the kernel. Yes. So yes, yeah. TC is in the exploration part. Uh, Jamal, as you know, we are still using IP tables and the, we are looking at PC as well. Okay, I won't give you a hard time, Rupa. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to quick status update on what's happened on DSA, which is basically layer two switches and the layer one part of the Linux kernel. So next slide, please. So DSA currently supports around 100 layer two switches. And that's totally in the kernel, no binary blobs or anything. You can just use it. DSA causes confusion because people don't realize that DSA is a wraparound switch dev. So that's 100 switch dev switches are supported at layer two. This year, it seems like Microchip have been quite busy in terms of all these KSZ devices. Athros also, one of their switches were supported. And Felix, Felix is a bit of a funny one because it's from Micro Semi, which got bought by Microchip. So it's actually another Microchip device. Generally, the vendors themselves are not supporting these devices, it's the community. And in the case of Felix, it's actually embedded in an NXP device and it's NXP that have done all the work. So it's quite a complex relationship between vendors, contributors, people just doing it for whatever fun. The core itself of DSA is pretty stable. There's not been many changes, a few bug fixes, Q and Q was recently added, but no new big features. Basically, it does what people want it to do. 
So basically, if you're at the layer two, Linux probably supports what you need. It's just a case of, is the specific switch you're interested in supported? So anything that's Marvel, anything that's Broadcom, at layer two, microchip, micro semi, some Athros devices, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there's pretty good support at layer two. Okay, next slide, please. Your yeah, mic's muted, Rupert. <laughs> Sorry, my lip reading is not so good. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. You said community supported drivers. Uh, I so Broadcom and Marvel, I do see submissions from them. So they are whether to the extreme do they deploy? They're they tend to be doing more layer three stuff. There's never been a patch from Marvel for Marvel layer two. And the layer three stuff, the Bobcat and all that stuff that's come now has come in directly via another company. I know there's some sort of sponsorship deal there, but Marvel themselves tend to be not involved directly. Okay. Broadcom, yeah, you've got a bit of support from Florian. So yeah, there's a bit there and it varies. Microchip tends to be a little bit involved, but generally the vendors themselves are at arm's length. They're not really involved in producing the drivers. Uh, there's been a general move in this segment of the market towards multi-gig, so 2.5 gig, 5 gig, 10 gig, and that's required more C45 support. And that's been maturing over the last year so there's a lot more infrastructure in place for C45 multi-gigs that follow the standard. The older devices actually didn't follow the standard, so they're causing issues, but the new ones, yeah, they're pretty okay. What's also taken landed in the next in the last few months is the new ETH tool using Netlink. That took a long time to actually come, but now it's there. There's a few compatibility issues where it doesn't do quite the same as the IOCTL interface, but they're also being sorted out. And they expect soon new features will start being added, which you can't do with the IOCTL interface, but Netlink does. And one good example of that is the work I did with cable testing. So there's now cable testing support for the Marvel FIs, the Broadcom FIs, and the Athros FIs only one gig at the moment. The Marvel 10 gig Phi should also support it, but nobody's written the driver code for it yet. And I'm sure that other vendors' Phi's can do it as well. Certainly the Aquantia, now Marvel, Phi's have cable test support. So over time, we can expect more Phi's to start supporting cable test. The Marvel Phi is a bit unique in that it gives you access to the raw TDR data, the time division reflectorometry data, whereas all the others just give you result. The pair's broken, the pair's shorted, or everything's okay when you're lucky. I've got a screenshot coming up later of what that looks like. There's also been interest in ACPI at layer one how you describe the FI, the SFPs, all the GPIOs, etc., in more system on chip setups. Unfortunately, that was pretty much de dead on arrival because the ACPI maintainers don't want to get involved. They won't act the patches, they won't knack the patches, they're just not helpful. It really needs the vendors to start writing standards, the vendors to go to UEFI and get this part of the SCPI standards. Really the issue here is that when ARM standardized on SCPI, they standardized how you do uh, disks or SATA, how you do PCI, how you do serial ports, etc., etc. But they totally forgot about networking or they made the assumption that networking is going to be PCIe, whereas silicon vendors, many of them are incorporating 
NICs on their silicon and there's no nice way to describe the complexity of a NIC using ACPI at the moment. So it needs really the ACOP standard to start working on standardizing how you describe this sort of hardware. And that's why I was, I was, why I was interested in what, what Rupra Dunt said about earlier and whether that actually had any traction with the Linux maintainers and UEFI itself. That's good to know. This history is good. Um, I, I didn't know how much ACPI was used on the networking side from the hosts. So my uh, knowledge about the history or is a bit rusted. But um, what we did was we did try to go through OCP and the patches were discussed. I do have pointers to the patches. It's, I'll share with you and then we'll see. But exactly what you're talking about, L1, SFP, uh, describing it in ACPI and having the driver just use the ACPI subsystem to actually get all that information was, was really cleaner um, instead of the SysFS EEPROM stuff. Yeah, and Device Tree has had this for a long time. So I'm always recommending if you've got an advanced configuration management interface, use Device Tree. If you've got something simple, use ACPI. But that tends to go against the vendors who are all trying to push towards ARM um, servers and they want ACPI. And they don't like being told, don't use ACPI, use device tree. But that's the way it is at the moment. Cool. I've also seen growing interest in PTP and MacSec offload. So there's a number of Fi drivers and Mac drivers doing that now, which is interesting. I don't really know what segment of the industry wants that. I'm guessing it's uh, industrial ethernet, but you, I don't know. You will see more of this in the context of, I think MLXSW and the switch ASICs also, MACSEC is becoming really, really important for, uh, because most of the switch ASICs, they do support it. And um, yeah. there's a current, we were wondering for Cumulus Linux whether we should just use the MacSec current recent uh, updates to offload and the MacSec driver. So. Yeah, and many FI support this as well. Again, it's something that's been there in the silicon for a long time, just nobody uses it. So I expect that's going to change with time as well. Yeah. And there's probably advantages of doing it at the FI in terms of it's totally transparent, there's low latency. Well, if you've got your Mac involved and it's having to offload it to some hardware, et cetera, et cetera, it's not so nice. Anyway. So did you review the uh, MacSec offload patches as well? Are you in the loop? With, that was I, I took a quick look at them. I talked to the guy in Plumas conference last year, but I didn't really get that involved. Okay. Apart from just making sure the locking was correct with the filer which sometimes gets people. So here's an example of what you can do with the cable testing on the Marvels. You can get at the raw TDR data and you can get interesting graphs like this. In this case, the red pair, you'll see the pulse is negative, meaning it was shorted. Whereas the other ones is a positive pulse, which means it's open circuit. So I just took a 15 meter cable and I shorted a pair across and there's nothing plugged into the other end. This tool is probably going to be open source soon. I don't think it's yet available. And you actually made a comment at the beginning about it would be nice to make use of this cable testing in switches. It is used in switches because Marvel switches use Marvel Fies and all this just works. So I actually did most of my development work on a Marvel Fi and a Marvel Switch. Cool. What you'll have problems is if you're not using uh, FileLink and FiDev because this is all in the lower layers. If, you, if you've got everything in firmware yet, yeah, you'll need to add a bit more glue in to allow the Mac to access all this, but it's just glue. It shouldn't be an issue. And then next slide, please. And then just looking forward, what do I think is going to come soon with my crystal ball? 
connecting the Mac and the Fi is getting more and more complex. There's these SEDES getting in the way, there's all the link training, et cetera, et cetera. And various system on chip vendors are starting to expose this rather than hide it away in firmware. Particularly NXP. So I see there's going to be work on the PCS layer, getting some of that. Some of it is nicely standardized, so hopefully we can get some re-implementation, some reuse of some of this driver work. LEDs has been an issue for a long time. How do you get the fire LEDs blinking to show what you want them? In the DT world, there's three different ways of doing it. It's not so nice. If you're not using device tree, there's no way to configure it. So at last, somebody stepped up to do some generic work on this where the Phi LEDs just become standard Linux LEDs. You control them as normal Linux LEDs and you can blink them on the heartbeat pattern. You can make it sure link up and link down, whatever you want, using standard Linux LEDs, which is great. Using ETool, I'm assuming, right? ETool. Nope. No? There's an ETH tool identify. At the moment, that's missing. At the moment, standard Linux LEDs goes via the SysFS, Sys class LEDs, and then there's a directory per LED, and then you can set its brightness, you can set its trigger, and things like that. It could be we link ETH tool in because of the naming issues. FIs have pretty or horrible names and it's hard to link that back to ETH1 or EMP2, S0 or whatever. So it could be we put some code into ETH tool just to make it easier to use, but the real kernel API will be via sys class LEDs. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I think that what Rupa mentioned, uh, mentioned is that uh, the, the, the indication left which is supported in ETH2. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a different story. Yeah. That's a different story, and that's something which we should be able to uh, implement a generic way of doing that, which any Phi which implements Phi LEDs, we can just make it blink. Mm -hmm. But setting it for other uses is going to go via sys class LEDs. And then my last gazing into a glass ball. ACPI, I don't think it really is dead. I think if the vendors get together and do the work, it could still come back. It could be a phoenix that raises from the burnt ashes. Yeah, the vendors are the key. The vendors yeah, and sure. going to UFA. It certainly won't be driven by the fine maintainers. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a small question. Um, can you please elaborate a little bit about power over Ethernet support? Same problem as everybody else. Nobody does it. There's no kernel support. It's it's something that would actually be interesting to put into the fine layer or it's maybe not the file layer, it's a new subsystem as a whole. Because it also probably needs to link in to the power management code because if you're pulling too much power out and the device is getting too hot, you might need to turn off the power. Yeah, there's a control needed. Yeah. But I'm not, anywhere, I'm not aware of anybody doing any open work on this in the kernel. Yeah. I've not seen it either. I was looking for it the other day also. But that would be something. I think Microsemi also has these POE controllers, right? There's a few different vendors in the networking space, so Microsemi, Maxim, and a few others. But they all tend to be SDKs, and yeah. there's no standardization. Yep. Any other questions? So Jamal is raising hand. Jamal, do you have a question? Jamal? No, I, I forgot to lower my hand before. <laughs> Sorry. Thank okay, you for the question. Chris, Christian is another one. Christian? Yeah. Um, hi. 
I, this is sort of a, 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 maybe a naive question, but we, well, we were building a project with these macchiato bins, which are Marvell based. And we yep. had, uh, we, they wouldn't work. Uh, and we actually gave up on the devices because we couldn't get them to work back to back. Like, so if we plug them back to back, um, you know, and it's, and so we, but we puzzled to ourselves, was this because like they were overpowered? You know, there was no way to adjust, you know, the, the SFP power and stuff. So I'm wondering if what you're talking about here is, is this about getting access to diagnostics on the SFP? Like, so that we could have like gone in and looked and seen, you know, is there too much laser power going or, you know. That's been there for a long time. If you used HWMON, we export the what the SFP module is reporting in terms of its laser power, its transmit power, its voltage, its temperature. It's all in, in exported in the standard Linux way. Okay. Um, if, if Russell King knows more about this specific hardware, certainly I've had no issues with one meter fiber links you don't need a 10 kilometer fiber link. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it worked when we plugged them into Intel NICs and when we plugged them into switches, just not back to back. They wouldn't talk to each other, which was bizarre, but what, what are you gonna do? Yeah, I, I, did, um, I, did, I, did, I did try twisting the fiber too, like, a, you know, just introducing, uh, you know, around a pencil. Uh, yeah. It's, I, I, so I don't know what it was, but okay. So it's already there. Whatever there's in, given the SFP is giving out is already in the, in the HW. Thank you. Yeah, the issue could be the SFP in terms of SFP vendors are terrible at following standards. Hmm. And if they don't implement it correctly, which most of them don't, you don't get the information exported or they put it in the wrong place or they get the checksums wrong or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So we've had lots of issues with SFPs which simply don't work properly. Okay. It's worth spending a bit more money and getting a good quality one. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I think that we are out of time, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, Jamal, do we have time or I think we're out of time. It's eleven fifteen. Jamal? When is the next session starting? So I was wondering whether we should give uh, in, in, in five minutes. In five minutes. Okay. It's a, you basically can either take a break or just wait here if you're waiting for Dave's uh, David Arhan's session, which is starting soon. Oh, uh, excuse me. me. I, I, I raised it's a hand, but uh, can oh. I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, sorry. So uh, can I ask a question about the uh, SFP? Sure. And so uh, yeah, so um, the kernel's uh, SFP states are tracked by GPIO uh, pins, right? But uh, what if we have um, a lot of SFPs connected not to the um, SOC pins, but to the, for example, CPLD, CPLD which sits on the I2C uh, bus? Of course, uh, we can write a driver and uh, implement the GPIO controller and uh, make this wrapping. But will be there maybe some improvement to have some uh, genuine uh, possibility to register like uh, a driver to handle these uh, states of the models. Um, I would personally just write a GPIO driver for your CPLD. You, if you want to go the different direction, submit patches and see what Russell King says. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I, we might have two, three minutes, I think. So I know Edo had some um, other slides on more features that he um, recently added features. Okay, so we recently added the extended uh, link state to ETH2. This is work done by Amit and Peter. Uh, we usually get uh, bug reports about uh, cables not working and uh, links not coming up. So the idea is to expose two new attributes via the new 
and Netlink ETH tool backend for user space. Uh, one is the extended state, and the second one is the extended substate. Um, so you can get, for example, like no cable is connected. This why this is why the link is not coming up. Uh, and there are a bunch of other reasons, uh, all documented in kernel, so they should um, reflect most of the states. Uh, Rupa recently uh, mentioned the the portal down reason that can be added later on, and adding support in device drivers is relatively simple. Uh, you just need to implement a new ETH tool op, and that's it. Um, and thanks, Andrew, for reviewing the patches. Okay, so the second topic is uh, QNISC events added by uh, Peter recently. So as you know, in TC, you can match on certain packet, packets using a classifier some action. But if you, I mean, you touch the classifiers to QDiscs, but if you think about it, the QDiscs themselves also do classification. For example, the red QDiscs uh, decide to early drop a packet or mark it, and the uh, FIFO QDiscs decide to tail drop a packet. Uh, and we wanted to be able to mirror such packets either to the local CPU or to a different station so that uh, users would have visibility into these buffer drops. So Peter did it even more generically, and you can basically run whatever TC filters on these um, dropped packets or ECN marked packets. In yeah. our case, we just, yeah. Sorry, I think we're over over now, and I think we'll probably be getting uh, the other okay. <laughs> David's uh, audience. Okay, good luck, David. People wanting to learn about XDP or seeing extended state stuff and QDesk events. <laughs> hey, I would like to thanks every thanks everybody. Thanks, Ido. Thanks, Andrew, for presenting. Thanks, Yiri, for and everybody else.